Yeah, thank you. It will be probably only the portion of us that's not playing with the Arduinos downstairs, but anyway, we'll talk about some hot issues for Serbia at least. And what I'm going to try to do today is basically uh, uh, inform you about some issues that we as uh, Share Defense and Share Foundation deal with on a daily basis in regard with uh, the freedom of speech online from several different aspects like technical aspect, uh, legal aspect and ethical aspect. So I'll, I'll start with this story which is probably uh, familiar to you, at least for those of you who are from Serbia. It's called Feketic and I've, subtitled, I've subtitled it Super Vucic because it's the title of the material that caused this entire entire um, story. Uh, first of all, during the stone storms in northern Serbia in February this year, the then uh, uh, first vice president of the government, the present prime minister, um, took part in a rescue action that was in the place Feketic, here in Vojvodina. Uh, and the national TV, the RTS, broadcasted the video, a video of this rescue action. Some structures who are uh, disagreeing with this populistic, they, they think it's populism, policy of the uh, Prime Minister uh, thought that they sh have the obligation to react somehow and they, they, they made a parody video which was published on YouTube. Uh, it had some sort of subtitles, some of you might have seen it and soon after they published the video it just disappeared from the internet with, uh, bu uh, because of copyright claims submitted by uh, KVZ Digital, um, digital distribution company based in Vienna, Austria, that is uh, responsible, so to speak, uh, for distribution of copyrighted material. Um, the, the company claimed that uh, RTS, the national television of Serbia, was their client, but uh, to date, until today, actually no written agreement between the RTS and uh, KVZ Digital is, is presented. So we got something like this. Uh, I don't know if you can read it, probably can, the bigger parts. Um, the, the video uh, was published and um, uh, was republished by several uh, channels on YouTube and uh, it, it disappeared from each and every, every one of them. And the problem back then was that uh, people didn't really make copies on their hard drives of the video, so there was not really a way to, to put the video back, back online, which has uh, fortunately changed, um, which I'll, but I'll talk about that somewhat later during the presentation. Uh, so Serbia and what uh, are we really dealing with is basically this is these are the statistics of uh, the most recent statistics of uh, June and July this year we had um, this is uh, all uh, news portals and journalists related statistics we had six cyber attacks on um, news agencies or news portals websites six cases of physical uh, pressure on on journalists, like no, no digital, but real pressure, uh, political pressure on, on journalists, two court decisions that can potentially harm the freedom of speech as it is, which is not in a really good shape nowadays in Serbia. And um, uh, because of all these uh, uh, events, uh, the international community and, uh, and the professional public and the experts actually in Serbia and international submitted five uh, negative reactions which were unfortunately uh, pretty much neglected. The legal framework is such that everything uh, exists on paper both uh, nationally and internationally, and internationally and I'm just going to show you some some parts of these regulations. I, I believe that the declaration was cited, quoted a couple of days ago here as well. So. Um, According to the United uh, Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 19, actually um, says that everybody has the right of uh, opinion and expression and um, freedom to, to hold without interference 
uh, to hold opinions without interference. So nobody sh should influence the people to make their opinions and um, express it throughout any media. So there are no limitations only to traditional media, which means that the internet is also covered by this article of the Universal Declar Declaration of Human Rights. And um, the Constitution of the Republic of Serbia in Article 46 says that a freedom of thought and expression shall be guaranteed. And uh, it can be restricted, but only in uh, certain cases which do not include um, something that's called uh, political opinions. It, uh, I mean, uh, because this case was clearly uh, politically uh, incorrect, so to speak, for, for uh, a certain person which had it removed. Um, but in, in here are only some serial, uh, serious uh, reasons why could freedom of expression be restricted. What about parody? Because uh, if you take something and make it funny, that is parody. And uh, pursuant to the Article 5.3K uh, of the um, uh, Information Society Directive by the EU, which is not obligatory, but is uh, uh, an example of a positive practice for EU member states and Serbia as a country that aspires to the European Union should uh, be in accordance with this uh, directive, says that exception to copyright infringement, infringement if the infringing work has been used for the purpose of caricature, parody or pastiche. Then again, we also have a local law, national law, that regulates the same thing, and it's uh, totally in accordance with the European, European Union framework. And it says that um, free adaptation of the published copyright protected work is allowed when it concerns, among, among other things, parody or caricature. So, uh, what was really the, the base for, uh, the, for censoring this, this video? According to the law, censorship should not be applied in the Republic of Serbia. It's not a law, actually, it's part of the constitution of the Republic. And um, then again, uh, censorship is forbidden, but it is conducted. That's, that's unfortunately the, the reality of, of Serbia. And who is the censor? I mean, it's really hard to answer this question, but I've put some pictures here that um, send some kind of message, like government protecting you from your, your reality? Do they really have the right to do that? The, um, the logical step uh, after most of the conventional media could be censored, like TV, newspapers, etc., is the internet, because it gives an alternative to the independent um, uh, sources to have a mechanism of publishing their, their findings, their information, online without depending on budgets or I don't know editors etc and people have taken it online with using several different different ways I, I've put uh, Twitter first because the Twitter community in Serbia is quite strong fortunately and people really tweet about important things it's not just for fun but uh, it, it has serial uh, serious social social and political political um, connotation. Then Facebook and Blogger as well, not so much as Twitter, but, but then again, they're, they're also an important way to distribute the tweets. So basically, they're, they're also significant. The other, the other part of uh, these thing, of these logos I've put here actually are some uh, organizations or web portals that uh, are used by independent journalists and investigative journalists. To, to reach out to the public. There are Peshanik and uh, Sins, the national ones, and the ONA, the Online News Association, which is an international association of over 2,000 um, different agencies or uh, information agencies that deal with investigative and online, online journalism. They're vital for, for our democracy at the moment because uh, in some way they're, they're the only uh, probably uh, trustworthy media outlet that's not being uh, censored, even though they're under pressure constantly by different political and economically strong structures. And we get this. This is something that was quite often uh, seen in Serbia during 
the months of May and June and July. Those of you who who live here probably remember, well, for sure, certainly remember that uh, many of um, the news portals that reported uh, information regarding the floods and uh, the floods that happened in May this year and the way the country behaved uh, within that entire story were taken down uh, due to DDoS uh, attacks and some different kinds of attacks which I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, later in the presentation. So basically we got um, uh, errors on the, on the websites and uh, uh, people were panicking because there were dozens of website, uh, websites taken down during a period of 24 hours. There was no capacity to mitigate that type of, of uh, attacks. And now we come to the challenges, which are something um, uh, like a sublim somewhat uh, of a sublim sublimation of uh, what, I, what I said uh, earlier. And there are several different types of, of challenges. Only five to 10, maybe, percent of the DDoS attacks can, can be really clarified in, in the sense of determining their source and um, the amount of uh, bots uh, included in, in the attack. So in most of the cases, it's not really possible to, to determine where the DDoS attack came from or from the first place. You mean, you see the bot network, but you don't know who is the brain of the entire operation. You can only make some suggestions which are not really backed up with, with uh, strong evidence, which is, uh, which means that then you cannot take that case to court because it, it can't really hold. Uh, the hosting providers, unfortunately, are not, are not usually very helpful because if they acknowledge the um, uh, presence of such DDoS attacks, that gives them a bad reputation that their servers are not really safe and strong enough to, to support <coughs> this, this kind of attack. So uh, basically what they say, uh, no, there was a problem with your website. I know your database became too... too uh, uh, big and all of these uh, portals publish sensitive material like shocking information and they the, the providers usually say well you publish shocking information so that's why people come to your website I mean 10 million people cannot visit a website in Serbia in the course of 24 hours because Serbia has about 9 million people or uh, something like that security was or is something that was or um, security is not uh, something that is seriously considered, even today, unfortunately. Even though after all of these um, happenings from the beginning of this year until now, people started really thinking about um, security and securing their systems, it's not, it's not still on a um, uh, satisfactory level so that we can say that uh, the systems in Serbia are pretty safe. The systems are far from, from being safe and um, the uh, general habits of the people, the end users who work with uh, mostly journalists and lawyers and uh, such sort of people who are not really um, technical uh, people um, don't have good uh, technical habits such as the lack of uh, backup is the most common problem because when you go and ask them for a backup in order to get their website alive again, they're just oh, backup, we don't do that. So basically you can't really help them. Uh, generally bad behavioral patterns which are resulting with general technical literacy in, in, in Serbia. There are people who are really well educated but the general public or the people who deal with these types of problems are not really, really uh, uh, they don't really want to educate themselves because you don't need some kind of special education in order to learn several tools and tricks in order to, to, to protect yourself. The other big issue from the technical perspective is the cost of, of botnets. I mean, uh, you can uh, rent a botnet for as much as 60, 70, 100 dollars and successfully take down a website. They cost pretty much a dime a dozen, so uh, basically, uh, it's easy for 
uh, even the, the structures that want to censor something, they don't really need a lot of money or resources to do it. They can just rent a botnet and start the attack from China, Brazil, wherever. The next, uh, for me, very important issue is the metadata. And you'll see in the second case story that I have uh, uh, that the importance of, of metadata is often more, uh, uh, is often bigger than the, the importance of the content itself because metadata never lies. That's not entirely true because there are ways for you to make metadata uh, lie. But as I said before, not many people uh, really use these tools and tricks to, in order to hide themselves in some way or just protect themselves. Um, now there are the legal issues which are probably the, the hardest because, you know, the technical part, uh, a bunch of technical people will sit, will sit down and solve, the, make a security strategy or just secure the system as much as possible. But when it comes to the legal issues, you have to deal with the state. And the state doesn't really deal with such issues. The, the law is regarding media and uh, digital communication, etc., is not really clear. And there are a bunch of gray zones where uh, someone can operate and uh, successfully uh, fulfill their mission without being punished by the law, without even being considered uh, in, in a court case. The court pro processes last for too long. Those of you, again, who are from Serbia uh, certainly know that it, the minimum uh, length of a, of a court process here would be about two years for, for something minimal. And these more complicated cases last for mm, sometimes even tens, an um, entire decade or a couple of decades. The police, the police doesn't have the infrastructure to in investigate cyber crimes. I, I think that this is not entirely true, but because they do have the infrastructure, but uh, the problem is the lack of interest in, on their side to solve um, uh, some, of, uh, some of the issues that uh, happen on a daily basis. And I'm go also going to clarify on this later on in, in, in the second case study. There is a huge conflict of interest. There's, there was this one case where um, material was taken down from a website. And we, because a share, uh, that's my mistake, I didn't mention in the beginning, maybe some of you know, uh, we at Sheriff uh, Defense offer free services from technical, for both, for both, from both technical and uh, legal side for people whose digital rights have been affected in some way. So uh, this material was uh, censored from the internet practically and um, the text was related to one really prominent political figure in Serbia who is still in in a sort of a power and uh, we went to the police and said yeah we have uh, this uh, evidence that uh, someone from uh, Serbia actually took down this, this, this text from this uh, website and we want you to investigate it and they said okay we will a uh, month, month or so later they went on a educational training in Barcelona and the educational training was funded by the institution of which the person affected by the materials that we uh, that was taken down, uh, well, they, practically that institution paid for the training for the policeman to go to Barcelona. So it's a clear a conflict of interest. There, you, I mean, if someone gives you something, you're not really in the mood to uh, make something that is bad for him. It's actually a clear conflict of interest. Social media are still not legally defined which is really, really bad. Because uh, it gives the power to the courts to con sometimes to cons consider them um, uh, media, like any regular media, and uh, other times they just don't. Uh, in the sense that if I publish something on, on, uh, on a social network, it might be considered, I might be considered a media or not, depending on what hurts me more, which is uh, they don't give the protection of uh, that media get, but they also uh, uh, don't give the. Uh, but they give the disadvantages such as uh, editorial responsibility, accuracy of, of the materials that you publish, etc. So basically, um, it's it's really uh, another gray zone as mentioned before. 
there are many of them and it's really it will take some time we had the new media law that passed a couple of weeks or a month ago and uh, it's still not uh, good enough in order to solve these issues on a more permanent permanent level the last of the legal issues is probably the, probably the most important and um, it's the bad data retention slash protection laws so it, in, in Serbia it's still not defined who, how, where, when can um, use retained data in order to prosecute you or just um, listen to, to, to your communication or whatever. It is uh, really, uh, I mean legally there are some limitations but it's still, it's still not clearly defined who and how can, can uh, do it. And now couple, uh, yesterday actually, I think, the, they're going to merge the uh, BIA and the VBA, which are the military and the civil uh, in, uh, intelligence agencies, and uh, there will be a new law, so now even nobody will know who and how can, can do, uh, can operate with, with the retained data, which are retained by, mostly by the internet providers, mobile uh, operators, landline operators, etc. This is a list of ethical questions that I, 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 I wrote, so I'm going to discuss each one of them um, shortly. Um, the first one is who watches the watchdogs? In, in our society we have, we legally have watchdogs which are the police, the secret services, the government in general. But who is the one that watches them? Who is the one to monitor their activity in the way they, they work with um, our data or uh, they work with uh, censoring materials, etc.? So basically, we don't really uh, have watchers of the watchdogs of the state. And it is a really ethically, uh, it's, it's, there, there is no legal necessity for, for something like that. But, there is a strong ethical background to, to this question because uh, how much can you trust your your um, government and especially the secret services is is a, a huge dilemma which I, I I don't me personally I don't really uh, trust especially the, the secret services and I think that people who have dealt with uh, sensitive data and sens sensitive work share my opinion. Uh, curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction brought it back. In many cases, the government says that they censor something or, or withhold some uh, information in order to to protect the the um, the public. So that's this first part. They say curiosity killed the cat, so that's why you shouldn't be curious. You shouldn't care for the information we hide from you because it's for your own good. Otherwise, you'll be killed, metaphorically speaking. But then it comes to this second part, the satisfaction brought back. The satisfaction of knowing something is natural, uh, um, comes natural to any human being. Uh, everyone wants to know everything. We're curious by nature. I mean, there are people who are not, but their percentage is, is, is slightly, uh, it's rather smaller actually than the portion of us who want to know it all. And. Uh, we, we do have the right to know how our, what's the real state in, in our country and what our government really does. Self-regulation or, or, or self-censorship. This is more um, related to the traditional media who have editorial, e editors actually, and editorial responsibility. Um, so in many cases, the media themselves uh, take down some material that they have already published, in a sense, and uh, that, I don't know, something is politically uh, not uh, really um, correct, and they publish it, and in a couple of days, they just take it, take it down. And the question is, is, it, uh, is that act self-regulation? Because they legally have the right to do that, but it smells of self-censorship, which is really the worst type of censorship there is. I mean, you can fight general censorship with different tools, which I'm going to talk about later, but self-censorship, you can't, you can't because uh, it's an abstract term that uh, doesn't really exist out there. It's 
they can always say it's self-regulation. We published it, we have the right to take it down. But what we don't know are the circumstances under which they uh, took down the said material. And um, now we come to this. This is actually a quote. You can laugh at everything, but not with everyone. It's, um, uh, I don't know if you know the case of uh, the Polish uh, newspaper that published a picture of Angela Merkel breastfeeding uh, the Prime Minister of Poland and I think of the Czech Republic, not sure. But, uh, and then the Prime Minister, well, it, it was a huge scandal a couple of years ago in Germany and uh, the Prime Minister of Poland then said it's okay, it, it can be considered parody, you can laugh at everything, but not with ev everybody. So it means that you should watch who you talk with, which is, uh, again, a sort of form of censorship, you know. Um, you should be able to share with your opinions without frontiers, as the Universal Declaration says. So um, I think this sentence should say, you can laugh at everything with everybody. Anonymity. It's another huge, huge issue, even, even nowadays. Um, many of us are all for anonymity, but uh, there are people who abuse it, of course. So, basically, it's really uh, hard to, uh, with the present tools that can be used mostly for good, uh, but sometimes are used for bad things as well, um, to determine uh, who does what out there in the cyberspace. So basically, that's why an, uh, anonymity is one huge ethical issue. I mean, people should be able to be anonymous on the internet, but um, people that do bad things are also anonymous. So we should find a way to deal with it. Yeah, not today, not here. Uh, collective responsibility, because these bot networks actually that perform the DDoS attacks consist of many, many, many different computers, people, etc. So, uh, who is the one to blame? It's, as I said in a couple of slides back, it's really hard to determine the source of the entire attack. So, uh, basically, there is a collective responsibility of all the people that are included in, this, in these processes. And the final one is, does the government have the right to, to, protect, to protect its people from themselves? My answer would be no, because uh, we're smart enough and old enough to uh, vote and to decide for our everything. So why would the government need to protect us from ourselves? We should be able to access all the information and decide on what is good or bad for us. So finally, we came to the second case I have um, prepared for today. Any questions until now? Yeah. yeah. From a month ago, we probably have another ethical issue. Mm -hmm. uh, you can say much of things, but depending on how much people listen to you, well, yeah. there is a new re regulation in Russia, I think, where you need to register you know, yourself if too many people listen yeah. to you. Well, uh, Russia is not a really good example for freedom of speech, which is slightly, yeah, you know. But basically, uh, that's that's one really, really big issue because that's about social media. You use blogging, blogger service, whichever. Uh, you have millions of them. And basically, if you have more audience than, I don't know, 5,000 or something yeah. like uh, Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Uh, some amount, which is not really unreachable, uh, bearing in mind the... Uh, number of people that are online, especially if you write in English, everybody can, can uh, from every point in the world, can read you. So basically, that, that is sort of abuse um, for me, because uh, they, again, they don't give you the privileges of being a media, but they give you the responsibilities. So you have editorial responsibility there, you cannot publish whatever you want, but you don't have the protection that the law gives to the standard journalists. And that is a huge both ethical, ethical and legal, legal, legal question. I mean, to what extent can um, that abuse of a sort go? Yeah, I, I agree with you that that's a really, really bad policy. So I hope we won't be getting that anytime soon in, 
in Serbia or neither of the normal, so to speak, European countries. Not the Russia is not normal, like I like Putin. Um, I just went back. The second case is since since is the Center for Investigative Journalism of Serbia, Center of Mia. Um, they published an, ad, this is the case I, I talked about, uh, with the policemen going to Barcelona, to the beach, or to educate themselves, whatever. Um, Center for Investigative Journalism of Serbia published an article about the special treatment of the child of a prominent politician in Serbia. So soon after, about two or three days after publishing, not really, about uh, a day after they published the article, the, the, only the article disappeared, which was not a DDoS tag, it was not the entire portal, only that single web page was not available, didn't exist anymore. Um, at the same time, SQL uh, script uh, it was injected actually in, in their database so that it could listen to, to their email server and just collect the metadata of everything that goes in and out of, of their uh, email server. And those of you who deal with technology know that that's pretty much everything. So every single email that you get can be uh, not read, but uh, it's metadata, which uh, I hope you are familiar with it. But I'll uh, explain it anyway. The metadata of an email consists of the source uh, email address, destination email address, source IP address in most cases, and a timestamp, the subject, and uh, some other other information. And by mapping and uh, connecting this. Uh, information, you can see practically who is communicating to whom. And for the Center for Investigative Journalism, that means that they can uh, really find out and map their sources, which are, uh, in, in some cases, even people who work at this, for the state, like insiders. So it's a really, really big issue. And if you uh, have your sources mapped, then you your sources will probably uh, stop sharing information with you because they, they'll have problems. So the journalists um, uh, working since, uh, at uh, since are still under pressure both digitally and physically. So their cases, they, they uh, feel that they're being um, tracked both physically and they're like they're moving, where do they go from work to home, the supermarket, everywhere, and both on the telephone, like don't publish this, don't publish that. Now, the interesting part, which I know more about because I was part of it, uh, the investigation of this entire story. First of all, what happened for us, I mean, we got the call from SINS and they told us, hey, you know, our, our uh, website is hacked and uh, uh, we are missing an article and we don't know what happened with it, so please help us. And we, first, the first thing we did, naturally, is we called the hosting provider and asked what the hell went wrong. Did you return to the to a backup version of the website, what's the problem? And the hosting provider was not really cooperative. They were like, oh, you come and see it for yourself. We don't really know, something happened. Uh, we, we have no idea what's going on on our service, which is really impossible if you're a serious uh, hosting provider. And it took really time to, to access the server, to gain access to the server because we're like, okay, give us uh, login information so that we can log into the web server and just see what's wrong. And they said, no, like you need to come physically here. We, we cannot really give you that type of information. And we said, okay, we will come. When can we come? And they said, in about a week. So uh, in a week, if you, if you have a normal crime scene when something is stolen or someone is killed, uh, if you leave it unprotected for a week, can you imagine what could happen there? Like, everybody has access to it, probably the attacker still has access to it, he can erase all the evidence, and other factors influence, I, I don't know, a dog, a cat can pass by and just ruin your evidence, and when you come after a week, you find nothing, which actually happened for us. And then we had to go through this entire process of recovering uh, recovering the state of the server we, in which it was back a week ago, but 
It's not, you cannot, uh, you can never get 100%. Plus, in the meantime, the hosting provider uh, installed some applications on the web server, which were for protecting. I said, yeah, it's good that you remember after the attack occurred. I mean, uh, it doesn't really have a point to, to install something that protects your computer after the attack has uh, been done and no investigation has been conducted. So. Uh, we managed to gather some information and uh, we went with those uh, data to the police. And they acknowledged the existence of a criminal case here, so they shaped it up and they sent it to the Prosecution Office for Cybercrimes, which is a state organ in Serbia. And they claim they don't have the capacity to obtain the evidence, and they're the Prosecution Office for Cybercrimes. What Type of crimes do they solve if they don't have the capacity to obtain these types of evidence? Big question. And then a team of cyber forensics managed to obtain a list of 15 IP addresses who were potential sources of the SQL injection because, um, as I said, it's a huge thing. They're listening to, someone is listening to your entire mail going in and out. You don't really control the email flow. Anybody can send you an email and that can affect your reputation and image generally. So, once we got this list of 15 uh, IP addresses, we went back to the POCC, the Prosecution Office for Cyber Forensic, for Cyber Crimes, and they asked for a shorter list. And then we submitted a list of six IP addresses, and they asked for a shorter list again. I mean, what can be shorter than six IP addresses? Is it that hard to um, no, no, they didn't say it's hard. They said it's impossible to track six IP addresses. And it's a really curious uh, number because uh, bearing in mind that the state accessed uh, about roughly 300,000 times the data of um, different type of subscribers to either mobile or landline phones. I mean, they can't really trace six users, which is... Funny. And after that, curiously, the court went into, into summer recess and it still hasn't started. It, it started working actually a week ago, but we haven't really managed to to see up to what point our, our case has gone. But it's not really, uh, it hasn't advanced, that's for sure. So, the solutions. I started talking about problems, which I don't really like. I always like to stick to the bright side. So that's why I'm going to tell you what kind of solutions we suggest. I mean, there are some uh, brands here included. I'm not uh, advertising for them, but it's what we use and we find them useful. You can use the same or something similar or whatever. So we have this. You probably uh, all know what these things are. Basically, uh, whistleblowing is a new trend. Not so new, but uh, it's become quite popular. And um, it became popular actually with WikiLeaks, and now we have GlobalLeaks, which is a really, really extremely useful tool for, for whistleblowers and journalists and people who are activists and are interested in hot social topics and political issues. And uh, I put here Secure Drop. I don't know if you know what it is, but uh, it's the Huffington Post type of uh, global leaks platform. So uh, some uh, news agencies in the world use whistleblowing platforms to collect uh, information from the community. And the good thing about these tools, especially global leaks, is that they give the whistleblowers, the people who submit the, the material, total anonymity. So you're safe, as it's, it's access to a Tor network, so generally your, your match data is quite protected. Well, yeah. Mechanisms of protections. There, I divided them on uh, left and right side. I have here deflect, which I don't know if anybody has heard of, but it's um, something that is symmetrical to the DDoS. If the DDoS are distributed in a way to attack one server, now uh, deflect gives the possibility to dis to distribute your website on several different locations that are randomly chosen and you don't really know where your website is but it's 
it's online and um, it mitigates the DDoS attacks as they happen. So practically you have, um, if some part of, if one location of your website is attacked, you have the other one alive. So it's really hard to attack all of them at once. It's practically impossible. And Deflect has strong infrastructure in doing that and they really have space for for many more websites and also many people now um, get um, give some donate some of their infrastructure like bandwidth and uh, memory on their servers for for deflect which is really which means that it's really community based and it um, it's from the community community and and for the community they're really great guys if you if you want to secure your website I guess uh, against DDoS, I strongly recommend them. And on the other side, we have a different kind, kind of mitigation. I mean, it's a sort of whistleblowing, but not really. Um, there are two web portals currently in Serbia. The first one is Internet Svet Pamti, and the second, which means the internet remembers everything. And the second one is uh, Cenzolovka, which could be dubbed as uh, censorship um, uh, catcher. So basically, with these two platforms, uh, what we can do is a whistleblow in some way, which is not through the Tor network, so it's um, much uh, easier for general public. But again, it's uh, hosted in a way that gives um, the um, whistleblowers, so to speak, or the people with, who have the material, um, the opportunity to, to remain anonymous and, and, and private. So basically, these are the mechanisms we use and recommend for, for, uh, for protection uh, and uh, mitigating these uh, issues we, we have. That would be everything for me. So if you have any questions, I'm here to answer. And here is my email and our website. So if you have anything else to ask, just you can contact me or us there. You have also the email, info at both of these domains work as well. So. Basically, questions? Mm, yeah? yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, I, I was a bit late, so okay. I uh, came in on a slide where you were talking about uh, anonymity. Yeah? Uh, I have a feeling that anonymity must be balanced with uh, accountability. Mm -hmm. And that is also something you have mentioned. Now, some people will say that. If anonymity is not uh, absolute, it uh, um, does not exist, same as in if you're not absolutely free, you're not actually free. So uh, how do you see that? Uh, where do we find the balance? Well, every tool that exists that is known to human is um, can be used for both bad and good, you know. Even the hammer you take for uh, putting nails in the wall, you know, the, yeah, you, and it's the same tool. So we cannot say that anonymity as such is good or bad, but the way someone uses anonymity, and I mean, you can not really exclude bad, bad people from the society, that's impossible virtually. So the balance, I don't know where the balance would be, but uh, if you regulate it in some way, it depends on who regulates it. Because if you give the the state the power to regulate anonymity, they won't regulate it. The anonymity just won't be existing. Maybe we need another independent body, like I don't know, um, an independent agency, maybe that regulates this. But again, uh, maybe the the entire point of um, the entire solution would lie in some distributed way of protecting anonymity because everything that's centralized is uh, bad in general. So basically it, the internet has, has shown us that in the best way. The more centralized the internet is, the worse it, the freedom and, and general uh, execution of human rights on, on the internet is is impossible if it's centralized but when it's distributed when uh, people uh, when the power actually and the responsibility is distributed to several different areas then you have more transparent and real um, uh, freedom on the internet I, I think that the same thing would happen over time with anonymity because uh, anonymity is something that is ne necessary on the internet and in general in the world you need privacy of some sort 
So that that would be my answer. I hope you are satisfied with it. And in the end of the day, it all comes back to us. Yeah, of course. It's all it's all up to us. So we, uh, when we have these talks, it, people talk about things that we can make the government change something, but. What I think, my personal opinion, is that every, each and every government, each and every party likes to have control over its people. So it's, it's a mechanism of, government, of governing. So we need to change our habits in, or, in order to protect our, ourselves and not expect from someone who sits there in the parliament or the government or any ministry to, to protect us because they won't, never. Not here, not in the Netherlands, not in the US, not in England, not in Russia, of course. So basically, yeah. Well, the EU does the same thing to its people, so it's really, you know, basically, yes. So, any other? I also have another question. Okay. You mentioned that you had uh, less than uh, co a cooperative uh, internet provider when you needed to investigate. What is your, do you have a uh, general experience with how internet providers, or could you recommend, for instance, for somebody from these areas, where would they choose their hosting service? Uh, well, uh, our experience says that um, uh, cloud hosting is slightly better than conventional hosting. So if you have the money, the resources to, to have something hosted on a cloud. And probably outside of Serbia, maybe the Netherlands, just a suggestion. If you have the money and the possibility to do that, I think that's a much better way to go than hosting it right here. And it's not that one provider is worse than another. When they face these issues of they them having a problem with security on their servers, because most of the servers, uh, hosting providers in, in Serbia rent servers somewhere else, mostly Germany, Romania, etc., Bulgaria as well. So uh, they have these contracts which are not really clear on who has the responsibility of doing what if the Germans have or if they have. So that's, uh, there is a bunch of issues that come with it because they're not a real provider. So they're like agents of the providers, you know? So basically the best way to go is to find a real provider who, have, who has physical servers and who has full responsibility over those servers, both physically, uh, digitally and in any way. So I think, and if you can afford the cloud, that's even best. So, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Comments? Whatever? No? Uh, yeah? Someone that said that uh, you're expecting the EU to uh, make your politicians do uh, the right thing. Mm -hmm. And from Bulgaria, that doesn't work. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, the EU does the same thing. Any government does the same thing. So, on paper, everything looks pretty and pink, but in practice, it's different. Uh, that question about hosting and internet service providers, why do not our newspapers and uh, freedom of speech sites and stuff, stuff like that do not host their sites somewhere in the cloud? Why do they pay services of our Serbian hosters even if they know that they are bad? Well, I mentioned the lack of education yeah, yeah. In, in their behavioral patterns. They don't really think about it. They yeah. just see for it to be cheap, to be okay, and you know, like some basic things. They don't really think about security as much as they should. We had several problems during the, the years. Mm -hmm. Did government take down some websites? Yeah, of course. I mean, you, you have to learn from your mistakes. You know? Well, they're starting to do it now. And what I said about the materials, I forget to mention that. Uh, in the beginning, I, when I talked about the Fekitic video, I told you that people didn't have copies. But when the floods came, everyone, not everyone, but people who are interested in activism and these kind of things, everybody of them uh, made copies on their hard drive. So it was much easier to start Sanzolovka and Internet Svepamti because they published such materials after uh, the people had the materials. So people can now uh, publish something, they have it on their hard drive. So. The strange thing is, is the, the creator of that uh, Vucic uh, comedy video, uh -huh. I mean, where is his copy? Well, yeah, uh, well, he had it, but he was afraid to publish it because there were legal sequences he could, he could get afterwards, so. And we don't really know who the author is because he was anonymous. Yeah, Vladan had something to ask. Uh, 
two days ago, the moderating one discussion about the cloud threats of cloud computing in Europe. And uh, I got one of the conclusions that was interesting is like that you can basically treat there is no trend of like uh, locally hosting things because it's it's like a similar thing with the organic food. You know, like are you importing something from like uh, United States and then you think here? And in the same way, the the digital sphere is functioning. There are basically borders. You can, you know, like uh, maybe you don't see them, but they exist. And basically, when you are quoting something, you you should think. Uh, okay, how many countries you need to pass until you will reach your content, and how many countries your your uh, user will re need to pass because on that way all these other countries are, are getting this metadata and, and things like this. Yeah. So the point is to, to post the things more locally as you can, but in the same same time more secure as you can. And that's sometimes not possible because yeah. and then you have this problem of legal issue. So your section, then yeah. you should mix these two th things on one side location of the thing, on other side the legal aspect. So is your country going to protect the freedom of speech, whatever? Maybe for you it's better to post something in the Netherlands because their laws are maybe better and more clear regarding what they can do or what they cannot do. Yeah, so right. it's a bit complex. Yeah, that's why deflect is good because you have it locally somewhere, but you also have copies on several different places. So once one copy gets killed, another one becomes alive. So. Basically, yeah. And, and most of, for example, if we are speaking about this uh, uh, balkanization of the internet and this fight uh, about who gets the metadata, uh, basically what what Brazil is, is suggesting is to have more uh, these internet exchanges in Brazil so yeah. the data is not going out. Yeah, which can be a good thing to some extent, you know, but. It's tricky, yeah. It's tricky terrain. I mean, this, all these things I talked about are still in development. So basically, you cannot offer a final solution that solves it all. You you can make suggestions, and that's it. So yeah. Thank you for your attention and.